David, uh, a little bit about your background as well. Yeah, thanks, Mohammed, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone at KAUST. Glad to be with you. Uh, I'm David Vesna, uh, Chief Development Officer and Executive Vice President of Local Motors. I am based in Detroit, Michigan, uh, the Motor City. So mobility is at the heart of uh, one of my career. Uh, I've spent about the last 20 years in Detroit. I've worked in, in almost all uh, areas of the automotive industry uh, across sales and marketing, as well as supply chain and product development and have done a lot of my work prior to joining Local Motors in uh, mergers and acquisitions with Deloitte, as well as in strategy consulting with a company that used to be called P3 Group, now called Umlaut. I joined Local Motors six years ago. Uh, we provide innovative and locally relevant uh, vehicles and mobility solutions. Currently, we have deployed our vehicle called Ali, a 3D printed self-driving autonomous uh, connected shuttle at KAUST uh, in collaboration with Mohammed and a number of other uh, members of the KAUST smart team. And uh, unfortunately due to COVID, we've had some uh, stops and starts and look forward to continuing to develop uh, mobility so solutions in the living lab at KAUST. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Khaled Al-Amrawi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Khaled Al-Amrawi. I'm the president and CEO of Bright Skies based out of Alexandria and Cairo in Egypt. Uh, my background is in semiconductor processing. I got my PhD and joined Intel in Oregon developing next generation microprocessors. Uh, spent a total of 14 years with Intel, both in uh, Portland, Oregon, and in Cairo, Egypt, covering the Middle East, Turkey, and Africa. I had with Intel different uh, technical business and managerial roles. Uh, in 2012, I left Intel and started the Bright Skies with two engineers. We grew over the past eight years to around 140 engineers, and we cover three main domains. The first one is high performance computing. Uh, the second one is automotive with focus on autonomous driving and electrification. And we have a third team in the company focusing on digital transformation uh, for bank and for enterprise. Uh, very happy to be at Kaos today with the panel and look forward to an exciting uh, discussion. Wonderful. And uh, I can tell you the questions already began rolling in, which is great. So we'll try to uh, answer them as we go along. Uh, let's begin with, with you, Mohammed. Uh, you're part of Kareem. Kareem is obviously part of Uber. Uh, you kickstarted the whole ride hailing economy. Uh, I know Kareem is evolving to many more things, uh, mobility as a service, uh, connecting people and things. W where is Kareem heading? Um, so Kareem, as you know, is founded with a mission to simplify and improve the lives of people. And with this, we started with the uh, ride hail industry. It was actually a B2B service and then became a B2C service. Uh, after ride hail with the mobility of people, we ventured into the mobility of things with Kareem Now, now labeled and branded as Kareem Food. So we launched multiple verticals in the MOT uh, vertic uh, service uh, with uh, uh, food delivery with shops and uh, order anything. And we also have an express arm for e-commerce uh, at Kareem. Uh, 2020 was a pivotal year for the mobility industry, travel and, uh, and on-demand uh, ride-hailing industry. Uh, it was a silver lining also a lot, changed some of the consumer behavior to uh, rely and test uh, food delivery, grocery delivery. And we've seen some of that here in the region. Um, with this also in 2020, uh, we launched the super app, so Kareem, uh, is no longer just a uh, mobility of people and mobility of things. It's also a super app that uh, structured in a way to further simplify the lives of people, whether through Kareem services or through partners. Uh, as Kareem, we handle mobility of people, mobility of things, and mobility of money. So with Kareem Pay, and we uh, complete the picture for our part for our customer through our engagement with the super app partners. Uh, you will see more of that in 2021 and beyond. Uh, on the 
just on the Kareem from a statistics point of view, we have 30 million customers. And we have more than a million captain, captains, we call our drivers captains. In Saudi specifically, we have more than 100,000 monthly active uh, captain. So from an economic impact and business impact, uh, we're very happy to be, uh, you know, have a, such a strong presence in Saudi, in the kingdom, and we look forward for more of that. Uh, the industry in general, the mobility industry in general, is expecting some transformation with the automotive, automotive uh, wave, autonomous driving wave. Uh, but for our region, I think this is five to 10 years for it to make a dent. Given that we are mostly a low labor cost, the business pull to uh, you know, double down on autonomous vehicle uh, is not that strong. Uh, you will see it in, uh, in the, where the labor cost is high, you'll see a much stronger business pool. And this is where kind of the go to market would pursue, where it makes sense from a business point of view. So we have a, we have a prediction of five to 10 years from uh, Mohammed in this case. For, uh, for, it, for it to make a dent, yes. However, pilots will start. And you will see it, yeah. Yeah, pilot will start, you will see it in some. Uh, uh, like uh, niche areas, like say inside a compound, inside private companies, uh, like Aramco campus, Kaust campus, big campuses, you'll see some of that. Uh, maybe in certain downtowns, uh, I would expect you'll see it in Dubai, I would expect you see it in Riyadh. Uh, but for it to be at a mass, like a, a one-to-end uh, global to make a big dent, I don't see it, like I, I would expect it to take about five years. Wonderful. Now switching to Khaled a little bit, there's a couple of questions in the chat here and I'll, I'll steer it towards uh, you know, uh, what we want you to talk about. Uh, you're, you're very close to the autom automotive industry, Khaled. You're, you're doing some work with Bright Skies. Uh, you have some ideas. There's a question here about what you think of Tesla cars, uh, you know, what will happen on the road in the future. Khaled, what do you see uh, mobility from your view? Uh, I think the uh, if you just look at the automotive industry uh, today, it's witnessing actually a revolution. The industry is changing in a moving more towards technology. There is like a, I would say a a competition and integration between the classical automotive industry and the technology and the technology industry. If you look at the market capitalization of Tesla today over the past 12, 18 months, you'll see that Tesla is becoming the number one automaker with market cap that's equivalent maybe to the um, next the the next 10 company next automotive companies so the potential of uh, uh, the conversions of uh, automotive and technology uh, i think is very very big um, the the automotive industry it is witnessing today i would say three different um, uh, uh, revolutions or changes number one autonomous driving where you see most of the technology companies investing in autonomous driving. Companies like Intel, like NVIDIA uh, are providing chips for autonomous driving. Uh, you also see the electrification trend or uh, uh, the automotive industry is moving more towards uh, electrification. Many of the, of the governments are pushing for laws that uh, push for more incentives and more uh, pushing more for electrical cars versus internal combustion engine cars. And in addition, you got the connected cars uh, and the uh, upcoming 5G technology. If you just look at the uh, three technology directions, uh, the, the three are kind of bringing a revolution into the automotive uh, automotive industry. And this is clearly reflected on Tesla, reflected on the uh, financials of Tesla and the potential of companies like Tesla. So in the future, in the next five to 10 years, expect a huge change, a revolution in the automotive industry, moving more into autonomous, more into electrical, and more into connected cars. Wonderful, Khaled. So obviously cars have a typical one-to-one -one ratio, driver, one driver, one car. Clearly cities are changing also how they can accommodate that. So David, you're closer to mass transportation and getting people together to go somewhere. Uh, you're currently obviously uh, developing some autonomous uh, mobility options for mass transport. Will mass transport also change? It, it definitely is. It changed significantly in the last nine months during this pandemic. And so if you um, 
study public transit uh, around the world, it has, you know, taking significant um, drops in ridership. Uh, so at some of the peaks uh, early on in COVID, you know, cities saw as much as 85, 90% drops on ridership. Um, for example, Milan, which at one point was the hotspot for COVID and even after it emerged, had uh, a an, an mandate to say that normally they move 6,000 people per hour and that's their kind of capacity. And they said, we're only gonna be able due to COVID protocols target moving 1500 people up per hour. So that's about 75% drop in, in, in capacity to the uh, pro, uh, COVID protocols. So overall, what we've seen though, is that on demand uh, to Mohammed and Kareem's perspective has been more resilient. Um, I think there's a number of things that have driven that because people who have choice uh, and have to get to work uh, tend to still make a way to get to work. And so we've seen more resilience in on-demand, but the challenge with on-demand, especially in a, in a driver world, it tends to be uh, expensive, significantly more expensive than mass public transit. So our perspective is that you know, autonomous vehicles, when we get there, and by the way, you know, bold predictions were made in 2015 and 2014 that autonomy is gonna be here in 2020. Well, it's 2021 and autonomy is here in certain places for certain instances. For example, at KAUST, we are operating level four plus autonomy. Uh, so it's here, but not massively here. Right. And so these are the things that we have to transition. And I think, uh, you know, looking at the history of the elevator, uh, hopefully it won't take as long of getting a elevator person off the elevator for autonomous vehicles. But this industry is uh, transitioning. And I think as uh, Khaled described a convergence around electrification, autonomy and connectivity for the individual automobile, you see a convergence of multimodal uh, where autonomy in the first stages isn't gonna replace mass transit. It's not gonna replace bus rapid transit. It will augment just like micro mobility augments, scooters, bike share, things like that. So as we move forward with technology and technology moves at faster paces and we have to deal with pandemic response or considerations, we will continue to get more innovative solutions to move people, but as Mohammed pointed out, also move things in this economy in a city without adding back to congestion. So for example, Paris has said that they will eliminate 50% of their current parking spaces. That means individual mobility will significantly have to change in order to accommodate uh, for that change in infrastructure. And so, Speaking of electrification, right? We have to change the infrastructure around public transit. If we want to electrify buses, we have to create infrastructure. So these are all big challenges and it's happening now, uh, especially, and I think most of it's going to get accelerated due to the pandemic uh, and uh, managing through that over the next 12, 18, 24 months. Absolutely. So zooming in a little bit more on what's happening in the kingdom, uh, Jumana, you're, you're part of the National Digital Transformation Unit. You have a mandate that is closely aligned with Vision 2030. What is happening in kingdom? How do we test and pilot uh, all these wonderful ideas? Um, so first, I'll just take a step back for those who are not familiar with the NDU. Um, so we uh, were established in 2017, along with the National uh, Committee for Digital Transformation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we work with both public and private sectors to accelerate and enable digital transformation in the kingdom, uh, which is uh, of course, one of the key pillars in realizing Vision 2030. Um, so along with that, we do have a national digital transformation strategy, which is a cross-sectorial strategy with a target of growing uh, the digital economy in the kingdom, and uh, we work across three main pillars, uh, which also mirror the pillars um, in the Vision 2030. So digital society, uh, improving uh, digital services, and improving the life of citizens. 
uh, such as e-health and digital education, and of course, um, digital mobility and smart mobility solutions. Uh, the second pillar is a digital economy. Um, and the third pillar is as well a digital nations um, through achieving excellence in government service with a focus on digital services. Um, so going back to smart mobility, which is one of the main um, sectors that we focus on within the strategy, um, the target of course is uh, to improve the quality of services in cities and to enhance uh, traffic safety in the kingdom um, through the reduction of traffic accidents and fatalities. We know that this is uh, one of the challenges that we're facing in the, in the kingdom. Um, and of course, uh, to solve this through different smart uh, mobility solutions and intermodal public transportation. Um, and what's interesting um, with all of these new mobility trends, uh, such as um, you all mentioned, um, is that we're kind of in a pivotal moment right now where um, behaviors are changing towards how people are uh, commuting and, and you know, moving from one place to another. Uh, maybe right now, um, up till now at least, uh, car ownership has always been the most convenient mode of, tran uh, of transportation. Um, but now we're really seeing how technology is uh, enabling these new modes of transportation and creating attractive alternatives. Um, so uh, in order to realize the smart mobility targets of the vision and as well as the transformation strategy, we're continuously working with different government agencies on uh, enabling and rolling out different mobility solutions, uh, such as integrated traffic management and, uh, as you mentioned, Hammond autonomous vehicles, which is uh, a topic I'm closely uh, working on. Um, so uh, just a quick uh, overview of what we're doing. Um, and uh, eventually, I believe that uh, these uh, new mobility trends will create better ways um, to make uh, the city safer and uh, easier for pedestrians to tra travel in. Excellent, wonderful, thank you, Jumana. There's a few good questions in the chat that I think we wanna kind of steer the conversation toward a little bit. Uh, you know, there's a question here on, um, on cybersecurity and autonomous cars. You know, we were actually having a, a, a presentation just before this one on web around cybersecurity by our Cisco uh, CTO. Uh, we could have asked it other, in the other one, but we'll ask it here. Uh, I think, David, you, you produce uh, autonomous vehicles that need to run safely and securely and certified. Uh, cybersecurity attacks on autonomous shuttles, is that, is that a concern? So certainly uh, there's a number of challenges around, um, you know, working with connected devices, right? Um, hacking, uh, because at the end of the day, when you want to use this technology uh, for good, and as Mohammed said, you know, Facebook started off as a friendly space to share silly pictures with family and friends, and now has over the last several years dwelled into a lot of misinformation campaigns uh, posted by its users. How do you manage the potentially unintended consequences of this technology that we hope to improve lives? So certainly looking at uh, how to secure that, not just physically, right? There's still a stringent standard uh, that number of governments around the world are grappling with around vehicle safety, physical safety. But then comes uh, the point of cyber safety. And if you live in the US or you're, you're paying attention to the US, uh, a, a significant amount of government agencies have recently had attacks uh, in the US. So even at that fundamental level of government security, um, there's attacks on a, on a daily basis. So from a, from a cybersecurity perspective of protecting what I would call you know, the stack, right? And the stack is, has multiple layers. There's the stack of the autonomy kit, so the LIDAR, radar, camera sensors that does the perception and then prediction modeling. So you have to predict, predict the integrity of that in order to operate the vehicle safe, safety. <clears throat> then there's the cybersecurity about data feeding off of the vehicle, right? Uh, all kinds of data, where it's moving, how it's moving to make sure that somebody doesn't try to take advantage of that data for ul ulterior motive. And then most importantly, you have to protect the rider data because as uh, Kareem knows, you know, there's a lot of personal information uh, that riders share between companies, 
uh, and the drivers. And so now you have to look at all of these things and, and certainly making sure you have appropriate protocols to secure how people get from point A to point B, but then also how their data is shared in a way that they're aware of. Uh, you have to be very careful about because it has all kinds of implications, both good and bad. So and privacy as well. Uh, there's a very good question here on Hyperloop and how, the, how will Hyperloop solve traffic jams? It's a, it's a very interesting uh, technology, obviously, that has a lot of massive infrastructure requirement. I, I kind of look at my panel here and says, who wants to take on an answer for Hyperloop? Anybody has a good opinion on that? I, I would love to share that, you know, uh, something that was just announced this week. So I don't know if Mohammed, you... Uh, you know, you have connections at certain places and you timed this, that they would make this announcement ahead of <laughs> on mobility. Um, but, but certainly Neom shared um, on Monday, I think it was uh, the announcement about the line and fundamentally having two different layers, a, a living layer, so to speak, where people move around freely, there are no cars, the, the infrastructure of living is focused on people and nature. And then they have a layer beneath the surface of the world, uh, of the earth, you know, so the line versus, I think it's called the spine or something like that. And part of that is I think a hyperloop type of concept that allows for the movement of people and goods uh, beneath the surface so it doesn't disrupt living, so to speak. Um, and I think there's a lot of infrastructure costs associated with that. And I do know, uh, you know that, that Neom is expecting to invest heavily in that infrastructure. I don't know from a, from a perspective, for example, in the US, the US has talked about requiring upwards of trillions of dollars to improve infrastructure on just the existing assets. So I think that's one of the things that is an ambitious challenge for technologies, whether it is Hyperloop, whether it is autonomy, whether it is electrification or, or hydrogen fuel cells, we have to fundamentally rethink infrastructure and infrastructure investments, right? The, the say the gas and distribute the oil and gas distribution networks around the world have been built up over decades and decades and it's similar types of investment that are required to electrify or create hyperloop type of infrastructure that so that's a perspective uh, on the infrastructure side which i think will be a challenge uh, for us for countries around the world that may not have the resources of a saudi arabia Good. Actually, we had two questions with one answer because uh, there was another question about uh, the line. Uh, Khaled, uh, you, you're obviously uh, in the business of uh, converting uh, cars and, and taking kind of a middle step about working with uh, with automotive industry players to, to change the car and, and convert it. You're experimenting as well and you're running some pilots. Can you tell yes, us a little yes. more about how easy that is? Sure. Actually, before I get uh, before I answer this question, I just want to, to, to touch on the cybersecurity aspect and also the functional safety aspect of autonomous driving. Sure. When you when the cars will become autonomous, you have to think about there are some technology challenges and some legal challenges. Let's start with the legal question. When you have an autonomous car and this car, for example, has an accident, who is responsible for the accident? Is it the car owner or the car manufacturer? So this is a um, one obvious question that needs to uh, to be worked out over the next few years in terms of the legal or the, or the driver who is not doing anything. Exactly, it could be the car owner, could be the driver, could be the uh, the the car maker, or it could be even the company that wrote the software uh, that's basically running the autonomous car. So this is like a legal challenge. I think the same also applies to cybersecurity. Uh, the car is self-driven. The car is connected to other cars. And when the car is hacked, who's responsible for hacking the car? Is it the car manufacturer? Is it the, the company that wrote the software? Or is it the telecom operator uh, who's basically providing the connectivity to the car? So these are like legal challenges that need to be sorted out over the next few years in order to ramp up autonomous and ramp up uh, connected cars. So this is one thing. 
The other challenge also is functional functional safety. Actually, we as Bright Skies, uh, we are one of the companies that provides uh, functional safety services. So we work with the OEMs, we work with T1 suppliers on making sure that the software written is complying with the, what they call the ISO 26262, which is the industry uh, standard in automotive that companies need to comply with in order to qualify for building autonomous cars or electric cars that are safe enough and complying with the industry standards. When you write software for the automotive industry, it's, it's, it's very different from writing enterprise applications because there is a big safety element, safety hazard that uh, could impact uh, car, could impact passengers, would could impact pedestrians. So there are many challenges, not just about the technology, it's about the technology, it's about the legal aspects as well. In terms of uh, converting cars to electrical or to autonomous, in fact, we invested in a couple of R&D projects where we converted cars from internal combustion engine to electrical cars, and we converted a regular car to an autonomous car. Uh, from business standpoint, uh, the idea is not to develop a conversion business, it's more of proving the concept. It's more of building the capacity and building the know-how and understanding how you can uh, build the key building blocks of the mobility, how we can build your algorithms, how you can optimize your algorithms, how you can make your uh, software and your hardware and your entire hardware software system uh, safer and more secure. Uh, so the whole idea of uh, what we have been doing is uh, showcasing the capabilities and showcasing uh, and ramping up our capabilities from electrification and from autonomous uh, standpoint. So clearly these conversion platforms are ideal for also for students and uh, researchers to, uh, to have at it and experiment with it. Uh, absolutely. Well. You can look at these conversion uh, vehicles as platforms uh, for innovation, uh, for future ideas. You can start using these uh, platforms, these uh, uh, converted autonomous cars with open platforms uh, as a platform for innovation and for new ideas and for new algorithms. Great. Uh, we have a question also on kind of uh, labs and uh, mobility laboratories. Uh, and also there's an ele element of, you know, can, can this help uh, nations that don't have infrastructure, for example? Uh, Jumana, the kingdom is doing some pilots in the kingdom here. Uh, there's there's some, some tests happening as well. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? And we can try to see how we can answer the Africa, for example, Africa example as well. Yes, of course. And I think you can also add to the question of the lab example. Um, I think it's a very uh, interesting and very uh, nice way to introduce these new uh, innovations. Obviously, they work in complex uh, ecosystems that already have agents going left and right, pedestrians, cars, and whatnot. Um, so um, it's, it's um, an interesting way to introduce uh, new um, agents into this environment. And we've seen some very nice uh, examples of pilots in the kingdom obviously one of which uh, are the pilots that you're doing at KAUST with the autonomous shuttles. Um, and I think we're gonna continue to see uh, similar uh, AV pilots across the kingdom as well. Um, there are some other notable examples such as um, autonomous trucking pilots. Uh, it's an initiative from KAUST. Um, they're investigating how uh, uh, autonomous trucks can work. Um, even if we go outside of the like uh, technology aspect and go to different new innov innovative business models that are based on technology such as ride hailing services, um, I think we'll see more examples of that. I, just recently, I think there was an introduction to a new peer-to-peer uh, -peer car service, um, car renting service. Um, so all of these uh, we're seeing um, and just to veer away a little bit from technology, I think we're also seeing some pilots on more traditional um, um, systems such as the Riyadh Metro uh, bus uh, system that's going to be uh, complementary to the new metro system. Um, so uh, maybe uh, um, to answer the question of how these can uh, serve like the nation or um, it's very important to first um, allow these pilots um, to observe them and see how they behave and make sure that we do already have uh, uh, adequate infrastructure, both physical and digital uh, as well as investigate what are the um, appropriate policies and regulations. So Khalid already mentioned the aspect of uh, uh, who's responsible if there's an accident, um, as well as really study um, 
uh, how well the consumer is accepting these different uh, solutions and how, how they behave towards them. Um, so that's, I guess that's my uh, um, look on that. And regarding the comment about African nations, for example, or continents, uh, I'll, I'll try to answer that myself, but there's some clear prerequisites infrastructure required for these things to happen. Connectivity is one of them. Uh, robust uh, road uh, infrastructure is needed. So, you know, nations will have to develop basic infrastructure to be able to advance into this era of autonomous uh, mobility as well. And this is why the topic of equality and uh, you know, is there, is there a, a little bit of a bias in, in digital bias? There, there might be. If nations don't have that basic infrastructure, they can't leap into this autonomous world and connected world until they build their basic infrastructure. Uh, Muhammad, yesterday you had a, a nice presentation and you talked a lot about AI and uh, mobility as well. You had a very interesting slide where you talked about how we arrived here today. Compute power is available. Uh, sensor technology has advanced so much. Data is, is widely available for AI. So a couple of questions here are talking about AI and mobility. How are they related? Um, I think, you know, we've heard that famous saying of software is eating the world. Uh, so everything's getting digitized. Big nations are having transformation, digital transformation bodies. Uh, so everything is getting digital. Uh, when you have digital, you have data. When you have data, you can be smart about the data. So you could use machine learning and AI uh, to be smarter than that data. So slowly, we'll also see AI is eating the software world. Uh, and you'll see AI and machine learning use cases uh, across the software value chain. Wherever there's software, there's an opportunity to be smarter. And uh, in mobility, we've seen it in, we see it in multiple cases. And I can, you know, just address three layers. We see it on the vehicle side. We see it on the marketplace side for mobility as a service. And we see it on the customer interface, customer experience side. On the vehicle side, the reason we have autonomous vehicle wave is because now we can perceive the environment. Now we can understand the environment. We can, you know, uh, make sense of unstructured data. We don't have to like, uh, I see a picture, I see a video, I can understand uh, what's inside that picture, what's inside that video. And uh, after that, like in, in the autonomous vehicle, there's three layers. One layer is, is uh, perception, which is mostly deep learning based. Most, uh, most of the time is supervised learning. Uh, that's a car, that's a traffic light, that's the type of the car, that's an ambulance, that's a police car, that's a pedestrian, that's the pose of the pedestrian. This is walking, this is running, this is, I have an eye contact or not, did, they, did that person make an eye contact with the incoming car? Uh, is that object, is it like a, a plastic bag floating in the air or it's actually something I need to, uh, to steer away from? Uh, all that information, perceiving the environment is first step. That's the first layer for autonomous vehicle. Second, second layer is prediction. Now that I have identified the entities in that image uh, and around me, uh, around the vehicle, what does that mean? Where are they going? What is static, what is moving? Uh, and in the next, you know, uh, from a path planning point of view, uh, where's the possible path of that entity or that pedestrian or that group of people will be walking? And uh, is there a potential of an accident around the corner because I don't see it and therefore I have to be aware and therefore I have to slow down a little bit. Uh, that information, Machine learning feeds that prediction. And this is through multiple uh, understanding the environment through multiple data collection and also supervised learning in this case and prediction. Uh, the third is path planning. And I believe, uh, I think David or, or uh, Khaled talked about that. So perception, pa prediction, path planning. The path planning is now that I predict how the movement will evolve, how the environment will evolve, what should I do? And a lot of that can be also, you are negotiating with the environment. So your action will also trigger a reaction. And if I'm merging of, if there's a congestion, I want to, uh, uh, to take a path, I want to take over uh, a car, I want to change some lanes. The way I, am I aggressive in my driving, I try to you know, uh, get clo slowly closer to the other lane. Uh, 
and how the perception, how the feedback of the other person, how's that person reacting to me. It's a field of multi-agent uh, environment, multi-agent interaction. You could learn that. And this is you know, how the industry is moving with perception, prediction, and path planning. So a lot of that autonomous vehicle was facilitated, was enabled only through machine learning and AI. The second is uh, the marketplace. At Karim, we connect supply and demand. We are a marketplace company. Uh, for people, we are two-sided marketplace. For mobility of things, we are a three-sided marketplace. How to do the, uh, the matching between supply and demand while maintaining the health of the, of the marketplace? There's a lot of machine learning there. How to understand the ETA, the estimated time of arrival? There's a lot of machine learning to, to, to uh, estimate that, to predict that. How to understand if I want to dispatch a captain to pick up a food item or a grocery item uh, per the time of the day, the day of the week, the type of the item, when should I dispatch that captain such that I guarantee a just-in-time arrival? I don't dispatch the captain immediately and there's a wait time for the food preparation. You will see a lot of uh, efficiency driven by AI by understanding how the coordination will happen <clears throat> between the different uh, elements of the marketplace. The other area in the marketplace is also uh, supply shaping and demand shaping. I can shape the demand <clears throat> through peak pricing, typically referred to as surge. So I could do uh, demand shaping. I could also shape the supply by incentivizing a network rebalancing. I could display heat maps to the captain to put them in areas where there's a, there's a lot of demand. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a lack of captains. I see a, a, I see a demand uh, with less supply. So I could incentivize the captains to go there and through this, there's some peak pricing. So they'll also benefit economically uh, to them. Um, through the optimization problem. Yes, and the other area, and, the, and you will also see areas with uh, multi-objective cost function. Most of the marketplace right now is they optimize with one cost function, but with multi-objective cost function, I wanna guarantee marketplace health. I wanna guarantee captain income, so same income for the captains that are loyal. I want to, there's some level of safety and quality that I also want to guarantee. You start plugging in multiple uh, uh, objective in, the, in, in that big optimization uh, utility function. There's also certain areas with the, uh, for example, on the government or on the cities, if there's a lot of congestion, and we've seen this when self-driving uh, sidewalk robots started to, people start to experiment, experiment with it in downtown San Francisco, it created a traffic jam on the sidewalks and multiple robots driving there. Well, one way you can uh, you know, control it is that I have a certain number of density of sidewalk robots or, or autonomous vehicle or cars in general in a certain location. And if there is uh, that density increases, there's a congestion, I could tax for it. Right? So the city can tax for it to ensure that there's a, there's a tax on the congestion that's being created. So there's different ways how to regulate the marketplace. And the last piece on the AI through that journey is that the user experience, the intent understanding. Uh, if I open the app, I get immediately what I need to know. I don't have to spend a lot of time to search. So that simplicity, a lot of the simplicity and intuitiveness in using the app, a simple app, there's a lot of AI behind it to understand the user number one, to understand the intent and to facilitate a uh, very quick uh, and simple happy path. Very interesting indeed. There's a couple of questions around uh, environmental sustainability, solar power, energy. Uh, David, this might be a good one for you. So, I mean, what's the impact on environment with traditional mobility and is solar power has a room uh, in what we do and how we design vehicles? <clears throat> yeah, so, so fundamentally, obviously, Saudi has talked about the, uh, you know, circular economy, especially around uh, carbon uh, and, and those impacts on, on the world. I think from, a, you know, as in the U.S. with this new administration coming in, the push for renewable energy and using renewable energy is big. Uh, our vehicles, uh, the materials, uh, which are 
provided by, for example, Sabic, um, uh, which is obviously now a subsidiary of Saudi Aramco, are recyclable, right? One of the reasons that we don't paint our vehicles is because of enabling the future recyclability of, of our material, um, which traditionally vehicles have been made from metals, you know, steel or aluminum. We're now trying to work towards carbon, for, uh, carbon fiber reinforced uh, polymers or nylons to enable recyclability. So indeed there's ways, uh, also the way we manufacture, uh, you know, the amount of energy needed uh, to go into making a vehicle is reduced, which is a sustainable. So there's sustainability practices around how to make a vehicle, both in the process and the materials. And then there's obviously a sustainability uh, piece around moving towards zero emission vehicles, whether that be electrifying the, the powertrain or going to fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cells from a powertrain perspective. <clears throat> and it seems like, you know, the world is moving towards electrification. There's still some uh, Asian manufacturers and even some European manufacturers that are pushing for hydrogen fuel cell uh, technology significantly. Um, and some startups in this space. So there's the powertrain. And then the, the third piece is, I think, how do you integrate potentially solar, right? So our vehicle happens to have a relatively large form factor roof where you could use solar, especially environments like Phoenix, Arizona, where we're headquartered or uh, Kaust in, in, uh, on the Red Sea, where there's a lot of sun. But unfortunately, from a from a powering of the powertrain perspective, solar energy wouldn't uh, suffice. But what you can do is if you add solar panels on the roof, you can use that energy to power some of the interior and electronics of the vehicle, which is primarily responsible for the human machine inter interface and, and interactions and use therefore uh, reserve more power from the battery of the vehicle to you know vehicle operations and actually moving things or people. So I think there's multiple areas of sustainability and we have to rethink, you know, obviously California continues to push for more stringent uh, emission standards on the internal combustion side. And so that's gonna continue to increase as uh, we move, because most people forget 100 million vehicles get sold in a year around the world. This year, Tesla finally broke 500,000 vehicles. So electric vehicles, as big as Tesla is from a market cap perspective, as Khaled pointed out earlier, they're a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of annual vehicle sales around the world. And electric vehicles as a whole are a tiny, tiny portion. I mean, less than one and a half percent of total vehicles sold. So lots of work to do to transition from emission producing vehicles to zero emission vehicles. But it's a journey uh, and it starts with one step that we took several years ago and we continue on that journey. Great, so we have about eight minutes left to the hour. Uh, the most voted question, I guess, by our audience is, uh, is the fundamental ultimate question is, how is mobility changing the way we connect people? So I'm going to go around uh, the whole panel and, and, and kind of give us your, your brief is that how is this changing how we connect? I mean, I think we, we answered it, but perhaps there was another kind of a take on it is how is it connecting us? So Khalid, can I begin with you? How is mobility changing the way we connect people? Um, I think maybe the if I have one key message about how technology is connecting people is number one, it will be uh, uh, significantly less dependent on humans. Uh, that's number one. And I assume with the no or with less human interaction, I assume mobility will be safer than what it is today. If you just look at the number of accidents that or the percentage of accidents that are caused by human errors, uh, over 90, 95% are caused by humans. So hopefully mobility will make uh, transportation safer and more efficient and maybe cleaner with electrification. Great. Jamana? 
Um, so uh, that's an interesting question, and it's the topic of the whole panel. I think uh, we each, uh, Khaled, Mohammed, and uh, David as well, and you as well, Mohammed, mentioned different uh, uh, mobility solutions such as autonomous vehicles, such as um, uh, ride hailing, such as Hyperloop, uh, shuttles, all in that. And uh, the way that I see that it's changing how, uh, you know, it's connecting people is that it's uh, offering um, more alternatives, more options. Uh, maybe one day I need to take this kind of uh, transportation mode and then for this trip I need to take. So it might vary and depend on the different uh, uh, needs that I have at that point in time and not just, uh, oh, I'll just go and drive my car. Um, and I think it will really impact uh, the way that we live in cities, you know, having all of these different options, uh, which is why I also think that it's uh, just as important, you know, as important as developing these solutions, making sure they're safe and, and making sure that they're uh, well used by people. Um, is that how they're integrated together. So uh, David already mentioned that uh, these new solutions are augmenting uh, already what we have in the mobility ecosystem. So um, one solution is just as good as how it connects to another solution. So that's gonna be a very important challenge um, that we all work together, you know, different technology uh, developers, um, the city planners. Um, so it's, I really see it as a function of design and planning and uh, collaboration as well. Great. Uh, Mohammed, uh, you touched upon a lot of this yesterday and maybe again, give us your take on it today. Yeah, so on the mobility of things, I talked yesterday, full presentation on mobility of things. Uh, we will have over the next 10 years, a revolution on the uh, connecting uh, movement of, of atoms, movement of packages. And what I talked about is that we'll have an atom net similar to the internet for movement of bits and packets. We'll have an atom net for the movement of packages with package switching, a lot of uh, uh, how the internet works right now, we will see it on the atom net. Uh, it will take some time to get there because in the internet we started with a wall garden and then we opened, uh, like we had an open internet. I expect also the same uh, with the atom net to have that same path. The value proposition for the end user is that I could send something from point A to point B. I don't have to worry how it gets there. I just like sending an email. It will be as simple as sending an email. It will be the most efficient uh, way possible. And it's reliable. It's guaranteed to arrive on time. Uh, uh, a lot of those benefits. Uh, second, on the mobility of people, number one is safety. Uh, well, less human accident, uh, saving lives. Second is uh, uh, cost reduction. And the third is the optionality that Jumana talked about. People will have choice, they have options. They have, it will be multimodality how to go from point A to point B based how much I can afford or plan to do. And uh, the fourth one is the impact on the cities where we, where we will see uh, less parking lots. We'll see a lot of repurposing of parking lots. We'll see a lot of repurposing of gas stations. Uh, you know, gas station, guess how many, I mean, there's many of gas stations out there I think a lot of those occupy a very uh, important uh, prime real estate. Those will be repurposed. Uh, uh, and the last one is kind of the impact on the environment. Uh, you know, there should be a high ut vehicle utilization and therefore there's less manufacturing, less need for parking and storage. And to go from point A to point B, you use it as a service rather than buying the car and using it less than 1% of the time. Great. David? Yeah, I would add, a, uh, I'll draw an analogy is about 100 years ago, at least in the United States, was, was the year of peak horse, right? And, and originally, everybody got around with horse and horse-drawn carriages. Uh, and then, you know, my countrymen, I'm German, uh, Carl, uh, Gottlieb Daimler and Karl-Heinz Benz introduced the automobile which at the beginning was called the horseless carriage. Um, and then Henry Ford here in the Detroit area ushered in mass production using the assembly line. So nowadays there's still horses around, but they provide a different experience. They're not used necessarily to connect people from one place to another. It's more of a leisure activity. And I think as technologies begins to be integrated and we have convergence of, of some mega trends and a lot of the things what, uh, what the other panelists talked about just now in their closing comments will revolve around 
choice and optionality for some and really allow people to, and I'll, I'm focused on people now, there's a whole nother piece on the mobility of things as Mohammed had pointed out, will allow people to be more productive and to have greater experiences in how they go from point A to point B. And so I think that's the big focus of mobility is I don't have to worry as a person about driving. And so I can now choose what I do during that experience. Do I enjoy a movie? Do I enjoy the news? Do I work, have a Zoom call while I'm moving? Uh, what those things will enable is potentially also, do I just enjoy sitting down with people and talking while I'm moving from one place to the other? So it's more of the productivity and the experience that I think connectivity of new mobility will, will enable for people. And, and there's no doubt this will disrupt other things such as the uh, repair shops, uh, the uh, insurance industry. You know, you, you may not buy a vehicle and you may not buy insurance and therefore there's a whole dynamic ripple effect on other industries as well. Uh, we didn't talk about drones today, and, and if, if we can talk forever, but drones is another, you know, mode, and that is also disrupting how we design cities, how you manage airspace, how do you receive packages, uh, drones come with propellers, you know, that are also loud, and there's obviously technologies to reduce that, so it's, it, I think everything is changing around us, and we're all eager to order things and get it right away, and, and we'll see how that obviously evolves. I think we are right on the hour, and, and that's a, just, you know, perfect timing. Uh, <clears throat> there's a couple more questions, but I think, unfortunately, we may not have time to talk about them this time around. Uh, I, I really appreciate all the panelists' time today. You guys have been wonderful. I would love to connect with you uh, in person at some point in the near future and have you here at Cal's. Come see us, visit us, and let's do some good things together. Uh, thank you once again. Really appreciate your time, and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.